Hello there, and welcome to a Second Thoughts overview of Gorok of the Lizard Men. Now, I played through the initial turns and checked the victory conditions, starting location, buildings, etc. So I now have a grasp of how the faction plays out. These are my conclusions, and in the end, I'll show you some army compositions that I would like to try out. Like always, a disclaimer that this is not an in-depth guide, but will have elements of it. Basically, what I would do before starting up a campaign. It should help you out to enjoy the faction as well. So let's go play with Gorok of the Lizard Men. So for your short victory, you need to destroy the factions of Clan Pestilence. Look at it here, the Pallid Nurglings. This is the very first one that you are at war with. Then the Blood Keepers. Look at it here. And Clan Spital. Or Spital. Look at it here. So pretty much all around you have some factions that you need to destroy. And you also need to occupy Loot Raise or Sex 30 different settlements. Achieving this, it gives you plus 3 hero capacity. This is great as always to ensure you manage to get some heroes without having to invest too much in buildings and it's particularly useful for the Lizardmen because they have a lot of problems with build buildings overall. Now, for your long victory, it's the same typically for all Lizardmen really. You need to achieve the short victory, occupy loot raiser sack 70 different settlements, and then to control the whole of Lustria. Lustria, for those of you who uh, do not know, is this area right here. It's the whole subcontinent what should be uh, South America in an hour, you know, the similar ones in, in our world. Uh, so that's the continent that you need to control. And it's not all places, it's kind of, there's a couple of them missing, so you don't need to, to, to achieve the conquest of the full continent. Now, achieving this gives you plus 10 hero recruit rank, great, to ensure that your heroes are much better as you recruit them, and particularly helpful for pastors. Now, Gorok, he's the Great White Lizard, so he does have a special right of Resilience, which gives barrier and defense bonuses for Soros. Starts the campaign with control of Lord Croak, which is amazing. He's a crazy good caster. Barry hit points plus 500 for all units when defending settlements and gets plus 500 defensive supplies. So he's very much focused on being a shield. <laughs> Actually, this is the, the, the idea of you expanding and then uh, good luck for the enemy to, to take it back. You know, that's the sort of idea. Now, in terms of climates, it's not pretty. It's not pretty because there's a lot of places that are unpleasant or uninhabitable. Like if you go over to this area of the map, there's not a single place here that is actually pleasant or suitable climate for you. So it's really, I, I won't even put the, the typical um, the images that I have here, it's really not the, the easiest campaign to dominate the whole map with. So be wary of that, remember that if you're trying to go for it, uh, domination, there are others that are a little bit better. So your initial province is a three settlement province, you start in the capital and it's quite defensible. It, it may not seem like it, but these mountains actually cover it, so as soon as you conquer a little bit of this area, there's like one or two areas of attack really. Now typical expansion is to really destroy any enemies nearby, you're going to expand in like a sort of a circle, and then of course you need to proceed against the Lord Skrulk, your first main enemy, you, you still face off against the Vampire Coast and even Bretonia to the top, uh, unless you managed to get them friends. So the whole idea is eventually to get the whole con control of uh, the whole of Lustria and then it's up to you. You consider that the, the end of your campaign or you go into other continents, it's really up to you. So in terms of diplomacy, you're part of the Order Tide slightly. You don't expect others to align with you easily. The Lizardmen are kind of their own. They're much more focused in having friendship with their own kin uh, instead of going with other races, really. But for the most part, High Elves, Bretonian Empire are likely targets. And this is mostly because you'll be fighting what they are typically enemies of them, so that's why. So just ensure you don't get treaties with any of their enemies so that you can eventually benefit and obtain these uh, alliances and outposts. Now enemies will be numerous and they will vary with the campaign, it will depend where you wish to, to proceed. If you go to the south and then you go into the chaos wastelands here in the southern and then you go over here then it completely changes Then if you just go towards the north and towards Ulf one, that sort of idea. 
But still, for the most part, it will be the evil ones, chaos, vampires, that sort of idea, Skaven especially, so yeah. For the most part, from outposts, try to get good cavalry, long ranger, missile units, including artillery, you know. From the Returnians, just the flyers and the good cavalry is really nice. From the high elves, just get some sisters or some other archers, especially in the early game. They really complement your forces because you're kind of out of range, so that's the sort of idea for the best outpost solutions for the Zindra. So in terms of mechanics, let's speak about rights. You have four rights, the right of primeval glory, it's basically the same nearly to every Lizardman. So you do have an army of feral carnosaurs, stegodons, and basilodon units spawning at your capital. It costs a lot, but of course, by all means, all the, the damage that you can do with that army. Of course, it's, it's up to you. <laughs> now, you also have an army ability of getting a summon unit of uh, feral cold ones. Three charges, it's really good. Yeah, especially because these guys are, if I'm not mistaken, armor piercing as well. So yeah, they're they're really cool. Now you have also the right of ferocity, which gives basically unit experience per turn, income from post battle loot, recruit rank, and local, local recruitment capacity faction wide. So if you're recruiting, especially in the early game, if you manage to 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 focus on this, it's really cool because of course you benefit from everything. Especially in the early game, that's where it's more important, let's say. Then you have a specific one, the Rite of Resilience. It gives barrier hit points for Soros and Temple Gods. This is only five turns, but it's great when you just declare war, you know. Declare a war, gather that Rite of Resilience, and the first few fights you'll benefit from them, those barrier hit points. And uh, this is not just for Gorok's army, by the way, it's for everyone. So, uh, The attribute immune to contact effects, so basically your uh, entities are immune to the typical effect, for instance, is poison, but others as well. And the expert charge defense for Soros and Temple Guards units, so basically they'll deny every single charge bonus of any attacker, which is great. Then we have the Rite of Awakening, very important because it doesn't cost anything, you should do this as uh, every time that you have that cooldown uh, off, and you'll have a, a slant mage priest available for recruitment, which is a very good um, caster lord, uh, very helpful for your, for your uh, faction, and of course uh, it, it's one of the best that you can use to lead any armies, because of course, uh, they do have access to some uh, lores of magic that you typically don't, so that's the sort of idea here with the rights. Now, another mechanic of sorts is that you actually start with one of the most insane individuals, Lord Croak. And Lord Croak is just insane. I mean, he has the these deliverances, the deliverance of it. So let me just show you the third one because all of these are really cool. But they're an explosion that cause they don't affect friendly troops, and they're huge. They're good against armor. So if if the enemy is blobbing up, this guy just gets insane levels. And if it, as if it wasn't enough, he actually gets very good boosts. You know, like replenishment rate for for your army stimulates the growth by a lot boosts the income, so even just this. And then you have, you know, his specific uh, abilities for him to be, a, you know, it's not a great fighter, but he's a great caster. He has specific, uh, those specific spells and everything. It's just insane how much damage this guy uh, can do. And then he also has the the, the Colossal Deliverance, which is an, a, to damage the, the walls of target settlement, so he can do a lot of damage either in battle or outside of the battle before, so yeah, it's really cool, really awesome uh, uh, legendary hero. What I would say is that you can, of course, have him under Gorok, and of course in, in the beginning you'll have that, but he can shine on his own in any other lord, so as soon as I get another lord I'll likely just trade him off there, because Gorok is pretty cool as a lord already and gives that army already a nice boost, and therefore I would have two uh, armies with a nice boost, one with the Lord and one with you know, that sort of idea. Now, in terms of other, we'd have the Blessed Spawnings. This is the in the form of missions. Sorry, I clicked there. Uh, in the form of missions that will give you, uh, if you accomplish the missions such as I've done, because I now have the Blessed Chameleon Skinks here, uh, then it will give you better versions of specific units. And in this case, for instance, the difference is these uh, Blessed Chameleon Skinks. You know, these guys, they have Strider, they have some other abilities as well, so better, better overall unit, really. And that's the main idea here, because if they are a better overall unit that you will eventually always use, then of course it's much better for your overall 
armies, right? So, yeah, Blessed Spawnings, it's this button right here. When you have special events, complete those, you'll get those Blessed Spawnings. And of course, it's the nice thing as well is that you can recruit them at any point in time. So it's like having a second ROR, you know, Regiment of Renown um, list where you can recruit just some units in a pinch. So that's always very tactical, very good. And finally, let's speak about the Geomantic Web. What is it? So Geomantic Web is this sort of thing here that you see. You know, it goes through every single capital, okay? And then what it has is different effects uh, according to its strength. As you can see here, for instance, it would give me a better effects for the, those edits, growth, income from all buildings, and more diplomatic relations with lizardmen, if this was in level 5. And how does it increase? It's very simple, you need to build this building here. So especially in capitals, that's where you need you need to, to build the geomatic locus, and of course, uh, if every single capital nearby has this one, then of course you're in level 5. Now that's the sort of idea, just build this building, and that's it, you'll benefit from better edits. That's the sort of idea. So in terms of province edits, you do have a growth in income from all buildings, then you have a research rate, it's excellent. Construction time, minus one for all buildings, and chance of winds and magic, so it's very useful, really, the research rate. I'll advise you to have a couple of, of, of places with that research rate, uh, eat it, uh, particularly when you want a specific research rate. Like, if I add it just now, it may not change those five turns that, that you see there in the research, you know, for four, but that's what you should do. As in, when you're trying to do this, make sure that it actually decreases the, the turns, otherwise it's kind of wasted, okay? Uh, then we also have this sort of defensive one, which adds control, chance of a, uh, a plague spreading reduced, which is important. Like, right now I do have a plague, I could use this. Actually, I will. <laughs> and uh, the, the idea is also that you have an enemy hero extra success reduced, less attrition when under siege, less corruption, and even an, uh, an army ability, which is basically a hex to the enemies for their base missile damage, etc. So it's very good defensible. And then we have a good a good one to recruit. So recruitment cost reduction and recruitment rank. The rank is actually the most important. But still don't underestimate having more leadership and weapon strength. This can also be considered like a defensive uh, edit. Whenever you're in a pickle, remember that you have these edits because that, that's one of the things, that's one of the mechanics that I think people often forget is that they can change edits. They just put, you know, the growth or the income and they forget about it and they're very good. Same thing with the army stances. So we have Astromancy. It does give a penalty of 25% movement range. Uh, you have a better chance of intercepting armies more ambush defense chance, vanguard deployment for certain units, and a campaign line of sight. So this is great special fighting Skaven because they're so annoying. Ambush. So this helps you out. Then we have the uh, channeling for more winds of magic and of course with 10% range. Um, this one doesn't give uh, magic? No, it doesn't, doesn't. Then we have Encamp, enables replenishment and access to the global recruitment pool, also immune to most attrition. This is, uh, without this, it wouldn't be really, uh, it would be a pain to conquer, you know, uninhabitable places. So I'm glad that the Lizardmen that have poor climate issues, they at least have the Encamp, which is great to conquer those places. And you still have the Ambush, so 25% more range, range, and you're hidden until discovery. So, yeah, and of course, for March, everyone has that. So, yeah, very good choices. Uh, notice the lack of a raid stance, uh, but Astromancy is also very good against the Skaven, so it kind of balances it out. So, in terms of buildings, there's a lot to talk about. So, four special buildings in your initial province. You heard me. There's only three here, but I'll show you a different one. So, this one gives corruption for all provinces and melee attack and ward save when fighting chaos, really. So if you're planning to go into the very well late game and fight off over there, then of course your armies will be much more powerful with this. And also diplomatic relations with Lizardmen. Kind of late for that, but still it, it may be good to, to if, if you need to to confederate some faraway Lizardmen faction that is still a war. Know, alive. Uh, then we have the Emerald Pools, which is great. It gives casualty replenishment rate to all armies and growth to all provinces. So immediately one of the things that I really like is the casualty replenishment rate because it's so essential to keep conquests going because otherwise you may stagnate that of course leads to some people leaving the game you know, because you know it, it gets uh, difficult. So with the casualty replenishment rate your units are much more replenished and you're able to continue your conquests much easier. So that's the sort of idea. 
Then we have a gold mine that not only provides income and Golden Island's resources, but also gives uh, hero recruit rank for stars, uh, gives um, less upkeep, less recruitment costs, and more recruit rank for Croxicor, Sacred Croxicor, Temple Gods, and Cold One units. So, a very good uh, choices here. And then we also have in Katza, yeah, in Katza we have an income from post battle loot faction wide of 20%. This is crazy good. You're gonna be fighting a lot of battles, so definitely getting that 20% as soon as possible is really cool. That's why I'm actually already upgrading it to tier two, and I want as quickly as possible to reach tier three. Then you also get leadership when fighting against Skaven, but this is only armies in the province. It's kind of like the bad part. Ambush success chance for all armies and chance of intercepting an army, you know, using those other ways it, to all, all characters plus ten percent. This is really good. This is really helpful. It's kind of like with uh, with this faction, with Gorok's faction, you have to assume. That these, because of these buildings that you will eventually get, that these are kind of like faction wide buffs, you know, that, that, that you start with. Because in essence, you're going to have these very early, especially this one, for instance, you're going to have it very early, and throughout the campaign, it will be very helpful. Now, in terms of the, the basic ones, so you have eight buildings that you require for full military, which includes. Uh, uh, the armory for some units and only two that can be built in minor settlements which is the spawns and the cold one caves notes that you cannot build the armory in the the minor settlements i believe you previously could i don't know if it is a bug or if it was changed but yeah if it was changed then it's quite a bad one and in addition to this you do have some specific buildings such as the star chamber this one gives a lot of faction wide bonuses here and you also have the scrying uh, pool which not only unlocks technologies but gives you research rate very important so if you can manage to get a couple of these it's always very in terms of infrastructure you have growth casual replenishment rate income control very basic ones and then you have the geometric logos simple ones then in terms of research uh, just a, a word here it's very cool it's very good it gives you a lot of buffs especially for you know specific units okay uh, and then the biggest issue is that you have to unlock certain buildings which are it's not easy sometimes and then you need to unlock here so that you can proceed there so you kind of have to to remember what you need to unlock in order to proceed okay so yeah but it's still very worthy uh, by the time that you end it up it's really powerful so and your all your units are really powerful so yeah just to, uh, try to explore a little bit of the of the specific ones so that you can get those as soon as possible you know to improve the units that you'll be using that sort of thing so you have your lord or specific skills, legendary skills for instance. You also have this line which is the blessings, you should count for it. It's kind of like an, a mechanic of sorts as well. For example, for Gorok, going with Soros Infantry and Temple Guards, by all means you can get this one. But it's uh, one mechanic that I forgot about, but just mentioning you do have this sort of line. You have to choose between the different effects, and of course they have different ones, so by all means choose wisely. Then I have the yellow line or the melee line or something sometimes caster line as well, sometimes both, the red line or uh, army line, and then the blue line or a campaign. I always say this, but I just, I, I always think that it's the first time that you may be seeing this sort of idea, so of course I speak a little bit about it. Now, blue line, it does include uh, upkeep reduction, and it also includes the replenishment, which is great, but they're all in the, the later part, in the second part of the line, so unless you're going to pick up Lightning Strike as well, for instance, I really wouldn't advise too much, mostly because there's nothing really that important. Uh, I would like Control and Corruption to be maybe bonded together, you know, or maybe Recruitment with the upkeep, that sort of idea that would bring, bring a little bit more... Uh, more of a notion to, to try out. Uh, Ambush success chance is actually the most most meaningful one that I can see here, but it's really up to you. So, because there's nothing really in the first line that, that uh, pops the eye, then maybe not going into the, the, the blue line at, uh, at all, you know? Red line has very good choices, rather cheap, but you basically go into either skink units, or you go into the Soros units, or you go into the Temple Guards and the Croxigars. These are a very good combination because, of course, Croxigars, anti-infantry, Temple Guards, they 
do defeat some infantry, but they're very good anti-large units as well. So yeah, immediately you have units for two rolls, which is perfect. That's what you want from these this sort. So you have some good combinations, and then dinosaurs are nearly all in the same one. So yeah, it's excellent. A special note in terms of heroes, where the skink chiefs, let me show you. The skink chiefs actually have the... Um, oh, not here. They actually have the replenishment of troops, okay? And then, uh, definitely they're kind of like a must for any army, okay? Then you also have the Scorus Veteran, very powerful melee lord. You also have this Kink Oracle, which starts on a Pterodon, that's why the upkeep is so big. So, you have some options here, and particularly, you know, different casting options as well, with the, the Kink Priests as well. So yeah, definitely pay mind to which heroes you're going to use in the armies, because of course they're... Important. Okay. Now and then every lord actually gets some specific buffs. More on that in just a moment. So here are the red line skills for the lizardmen. Like I mentioned, uh, quite a lot of mixed units in, so you can have uh, different compositions and buff every unit in that composition very easily. So for instance, like this one, that gives to croxigors and secret croxigors, as well as many of the skink units and some salamanders. So of course you can have some armies based around this skill. Uh, even, you know, and just spending here and suddenly you have an army. That's sort of idea. Uh, my biggest gripe is actually the division between the Temple Guards and the Soros units, which it does create like the definite decision that you need to do, as in I'm going to go into Soros or not. And especially, they can't have the same effects really. Melee attack, melee defense, armor, like you know. Yeah, that's just the sort of idea. A good one is actually having all the dinosaurs here, which is also helpful. So let's go into Gorok. Gorok gives some interesting buffs with the unit mass to the Lord's army and missile resistance. So, of course, with the unit mass, dinosaurs are kind of like a must. But, of course, your infantry is also very powerful. Then he focuses a little bit more on source units and temple gods. So, what I have is basically compositions that uh, you, some of these you may have already seen. So, some temple gods for the end of large and front line with croxicors on, the, on their backs and some missile uh, monsters, some bastilodons to get some replenishment going, and that's it. That's what you need. Or maybe you're going to Soros and then you capitalize on that um, mass, the unit's mass, with several big dinosaurs, There's some ancient salamanders just for good measure to get some missiles going. Of course, the Stegodons also have that artillery based, which is really cool. Or you can go into just some basic, you know, Croxicors and Temple Gods with just some missile troops and then have those ancient Stegodons as a muscle and, of course, benefiting from that unit mass. That's the sort of ideas that we'll try out. Of course, I can only choose one of these, but, you know, I'll choose one or this one for the first campaign, and this one, maybe I'll go with a different uh, idea for Gorok in this campaign, you know, that sort of idea. Then we have different compositions. Some of these you already saw above similarities. I like to combine the Temple Guards with the Croxigors because of that skill, because it's just so effective. Look how many redline skills you need for all of these two compositions, which is great. You know, and that's why you see this, the... the the Salamander Pack and the Razor Gone and the Chameleons, because they're all buffed by the same skill line, which is great. Of course, you have all your missile necessities. These are anti-large, these are uh, anti-armor, and these guys are just all-purpose, all basically skirmishers, so that's great. That's the sort of idea that I want you to take from here. Or just going to Sorrows with some missiles and some big old dinosaurs, you know, especially with these guys combined really well, because the Dread Sergeants are good anti-infantry, and the Carnosaurs are your anti-large, so that's why you're finding those. And then we do have some combinations here with the skink leaders, you know, the, the skinks, because they can either choose this or this, so you can go into more of a cold one and pterodon units, or you can go into the, the chameleon skinks and just benefit uh, them throughout. These are very good, uh, like I like to call them, sweeper armies. As in armies that you wouldn't necessarily bring to fight chosen, but they can certainly put a hurt on a lot of minor enemies or conquer, you know, just the minor settlements around. And finally, just some basic units uh, around the Soros Warriors that you'll be using a lot because of Gorox, uh, the special ride, for instance, and just either some flyers and monsters, you know, just typically enjoying a little bit of variety in your campaigns. It's always nice, and you can see nearly every single style of unit here, which is basically what I'd like to go for.
So, Gorok does not bring much in terms of different mechanics, but starting with Lord Croak is a big deal. He's crazy good when he's leveled up, and he dishes out tremendous damage, even in, throughout the game. Even early, late game, mid game, whatever, he's really cool. Gorok, by where it stands, is a tank of lords, and, uh, one that everyone will have some trouble getting rid of, so that's his main strength. Uh, enemies will try to focus him down, and he just doesn't die. Now, in terms of the campaign, you're once more into Lustria, but you do have the middle spot, so enemies are all around you. It's an easier campaign because of both Gorok and Lord Krok, but and the focus on Temple Guards and Soros Warriors is welcoming for a specific playstyle as well. Now, your army, for the most part, consists of good infantry, good skirmishers, good cavalry and flyers, good monstrous infantry, great and vast array of single entities, I love those. They do like typical artillery and they like some range overall. These are two are the ones that you should get from outposts. Now, replenishment is good, mainly because of climate issues, of course, but you also have that building. You also have that building that will assist you, if it is in Ketze, yeah. So with this building, with the... No, sorry, it's an it's a, sorry. There we go. With this building for the casualty replenishment rate, this will help you out throughout, which is uh, better than other Lizmen overall. And by the time that you get that building, that's exactly when you're likely going to be facing uninhabitable terrain or, or unpleasant. Yeah. At least. Okay? So, yep. Yeah, time to conquer all of Lustria, maybe the world, with Gorok and his follower, Lord Croak.